Good morning. That was pretty good. Sometimes it takes more than one time to, to, to uh, get people moving a little bit. Um, super glad that you're here today. And uh, we're starting a series called Good for the Soul. What's good for your soul? Uh, that would be worth knowing. And we're going to look at a passage of scripture that actually asks a question a couple of times. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? So we're going to be in uh, Psalm 42. And uh, this psalm is actually, not all the psalms were written by David. Uh, there are multiple contributors to the, to the book of Psalms. There's actually five books in Psalms, believe it or not. And 11 of these were written by a, a, a group known as the Sons of Korah. And uh, in case you don't know who that is, Korah was actually a cousin of Moses and responsible for rebellion against Moses. It was kind of one of those uh, 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 super moments in the history of Israel. And uh, Moses just told everybody, uh, you probably want to create a little distance between you and Korah right now. And people backed up, not everybody, there were some people who stayed with him. And the ground opened up and swallowed Korah and those who were standing near him and then closed up on top of him. How many would love to see something like that? Yeah. <laughs> None of us would. What's fascinating is that the, the offspring of Korah were not destroyed. And in fact, they didn't lose their position. They were part of the tribe of Levi. And while they were not priests, they were responsible for works of artisanship. Uh, they, they made things for the tabernacle. They wrote songs. They were vocalist and instrumentalist. And they maintained that position. And this is one of the songs written by the sons of Korah. So Psalm 42, and it says, As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. Now we're going to try something a little uh, different today. And what I'd like to do is some responsive reading. So I'm going to reread verse 1, and then I'm going to have you read verse 2. I'll read verse 3. We'll do even and not. How's that go? All right? So I'll start over. You ready? Here we go if I can get back to the beginning. All right. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Deep calls to deep. In the roar of your waterfalls, all the waves and breakers have swept over me. I say to my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for yet will I praise him, my Savior and my God. As it turns out, the condition of our soul is not directly connected to the conditions of our circumstances. There's a passage written by the Apostle John. It's his third epistle, so it's third John. And in the second verse of that, he says, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and prosper as your soul prospers. In other words, things aren't going so well for you financially and physically right now, but your soul is really good. So our circumstances don't determine 
the health and the well-being of our soul. It's possible for things to be going really well in our life and our soul to be unsettled and drained and lack resilience. It's also possible for things to be very difficult in life and for us to have a sense of peace and confidence. And, and so the condition of our soul is not impacted by our circumstances. Something else determines that. So the question I would have for you this morning, how is your soul? How is your soul? Does it feel flexible, peaceful, hopeful, assured? Or does it feel rigid, unsettled, fearful, and apprehensive? A lot of times we focus our time and energy and resources in trying to change our circumstances, to improve them, to make them better. And that's worthwhile. Like that's part of the responsibilities of life. But I wonder if we know what it takes to improve our soul, to strengthen our soul. How much time do you think you spend on soul care and soul feeding? So certain things can happen to our soul. Uh, this particular psalm provides some language for us to understand some of the things that are happening beneath the surface on the internal part of our being. And it tells us that our soul can become downcast. And the psalmist actually gives us some examples of what this is like. He, he describes his emotions as being elevated and a little bit out of control. He describes his tears just streaming constantly and, and he says, that's become my food. He also describes a loss of appetite. He says, really, the only thing I'm eating or drinking these days is, is my own tears. He cannot look up, he cannot get up. And lots of people who pursue spiritual truth often consider this kind of experience to be abnormal. But you have to know that our world is not kind to the human soul. And our souls experience this kind of thing with a greater regularity than we would hope for. Even when our needs are met, our soul can feel brittle and fragile and parched. Our soul can become hard. Our soul can become hard. Uh, how does that happen? It's really interesting. If someone else gets promoted instead of you or over you, when someone else is shown favor, how can you tell if your soul is getting hard? You tend to see yourself as a victim. And we can be so, become so wrapped up with the pain that we're experiencing that we're going through that we often don't recognize the pain that we may be causing other people in our lives. God cannot be the center of your life if your offenses are the center of your life. Uh, our soul can become shallow. Um, how can you tell if your soul is getting shallow? Well, our world is filled with superficiality, but uh, our soul doesn't do well with that. Uh, we need, uh, our, our culture tells us we need more money, we need more opportunities, we need more talent, we need more, all of those things. And what we really need in our life is more depth. You, we could actually do with less stuff if there was more depth to our lives. It was in the, one of the verses that we looked at this morning, deep calls to deep. I think it was verse seven. Deep calls to deep. Your soul is the deepest part of you. And if it is shallow, we are in trouble. We are not made to live in the shallows. Our soul doesn't do well there. Crises in life, challenges of life, losses in life all demand depth from us. If our, soul is, if our soul is shallow, it's going to be a challenge. A deep soul can, ask, can actually empathize with other people when they're going through difficulties. A deep soul can actually ask questions instead of just making accusations. So our soul can become shallow. Our, our soul can also become cluttered, just too full of stuff our assumption in life basically is if we have more, we're doing better. So we can become really busy and we can have um, 
lots of things, but not so much time for the people that matter in our life. We're, we're unable to enjoy the blessings and the good things that God has given to us. The word mine and the word more often become a clog to our soul and we get overly cluttered. So how are we to manage this? The psalmist asks, why are you downcast, O my soul? And, and one of the primary reasons our soul gets downcast, our, our soul gets hardened, our, our soul gets fragile, our soul gets shallow, our soul gets over busy and over cluttered is because of the interruption of faith community. Did you see it in verse four? I used to go, I used to go to the house of God. I used to go to the house of God. If there's one thing COVID reminded us of is the interruption of gathering with the community of faith kind of thins us out. We find ourselves becoming more easily frustrated and a lot more defensive. Well, that's just the way the world is and that's more political. Can I tell you something this morning? When the people of God have some depth to the soul, you would be astonished how much influence that has in our world. And when we get thinned out in our soul, that also has an astonishing influence in our world. Uh, we can find ourselves very frustrated and distracted and we can become disinterested and, and we feel overwhelmed. This is what happens when our soul is not doing all that well. And don't get me wrong, there's great value in personal and private spiritual disciplines and habits. Those are all valuable, but there's also great value in corporate worship and coming together and in singing the praises of God together and hearing the word of God together. That makes a difference. That's not the same thing. My private time with God is not the same thing as my public time with other people and God. There's different kinds of soul muscles that get used when we come together. There are certain prayers that we will never pray when we are just by ourselves. There are certain truths that we will never hear or think if we are just by ourselves. Scripture is unrelenting on this truth. We need each other. There's no such thing as lone ranger spirituality, isolated spirituality. It's, it's completely counterintuitive to everything Scripture teaches about a faith community. It just does something for our soul to get together and to sing the praises of God and to hear the word of God. Uh, there's another thing so that, that can uh, uh, cause our soul to be downcast. And, and the Bible says in this, in this Psalm, an accusing voice, where is your God? The basic argument here is that if I feel weary and if I feel overwhelmed, then God must be absent in my life. If things are not going according to plan, God must be absent in my life. If things happen that seem unfair, God must be absent in my life. And by the way, sometimes we don't need someone else to say, where is your God? We have an internal voice that's capable of that accusation as well. And we keep asking ourselves, why am I downcast? Why am I downcast? Why do I feel disturbed? So the solution to a downcast soul is hope. The solution to a downcast soul is hope. Now, I have to tell you something about hope that may surprise you. Hope is rather violent. There is nothing so unsettling or disruptive to the status quo than hope. Hope absolutely refuses to define the future by what it sees in the present. Hope undermines discouragement. It erodes the foundation of the, the, the concept that nothing is ever going to change. Hope refuses, how does it do it? Hope refuses to exclude either the heart of God or the power of God from any predictions that are made about the future. We hear a lot of predictions that are made about the future that are absent the heart of God and the power of God. And how many would agree? We need a little more, a few more predictions that include the heart of God and include the power of God so that we've got something to look forward to other than just what we're seeing right now. Amen? 
So we can forecast doom and gloom. And by the way, if you do that, you will be completely accepted in our culture. In fact, if you hear something bad, just amplify it a little bit, make it a little bit worse, and they'll think you're even smarter. That's how our culture works. If you actually believe that things will improve, you are considered naive. There is something wrong with you. How can we have hope? Because our hope is not in the wisdom of man. Our hope is in God. And we're told that we have a reason to hope. I will, this is great, I will remember you. I will remember you. If we search our memory and our journey with God, we will find examples and reasons to hope in God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness is not eliminated in our trials. It is actually proven in our trials. Let's just check. How many have been through at least one difficult thing in your life where the faithfulness of God was proven in the midst of that difficulty and your faith was strengthened as a result of it? Let's just check. Just look around the room. Just look Look around the room, the hands that are up, because God proved his faithfulness to us, and he does it time and time and time again. I will hope, because in the midst of the trial, that's where God proves his faithfulness. He sent the right people at the right time to encourage us. He opened doors we didn't even know existed. He increased our faith. He strengthened our character. He generously shared his wisdom with us, and he consistently provided for our needs. How many are grateful for the faithfulness of God in your life? Remember those things. Remember those things. If you want to increase your hope, review the workings of God in your life. And then the object of our hope is God. Now, this is important. So often our hope is not in God. Our hope is in the change we want. It's in the job we want. It's in the relationship we want. It's in the health that we want to experience. If your hope is in those circumstances, you are in for a bumpy ride. But if your hope is in God, you will have a solid foundation on which to stand. It is one thing to wait on a change. It is another thing to wait on the Lord. And Isaiah tells us that those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength and they will mount up with wings as eagles and they will run and not be weary and they will walk and not faint. Don't just wait on someone or something to change. Wait on God. That makes all the difference in the world. Wait on God. Put your hope in God. Put your hope in God. Why? The psalmist tells us he's our Savior and our Lord. Crosses don't eliminate him. Tombs don't contain him. Wounds don't deter him. Darkness doesn't hide him. False accusations don't change him. Put your hope in God. Lots of other things and lots of other people will disappoint you, but hope in God does not make us ashamed. And then pour out your soul. Pour out your soul. That was a phrase that was used in the psalm. What does that mean to pour out your soul? Some people think it means to complain. That is not pouring out your soul. Something is being poured out, but I'm not sure what it is. What does it mean to pour out your soul? It literally, it's a phrase used to describe incredibly honest and intimate conversation. That's what it means. Incredibly honest and intimate conversation. The capacity to, free, to speak freely, to speak freely about your most deeply felt emotions and your most private thoughts. When was the last time you had a very free flowing conversation with God about what you were feeling or what you were fearing? We blocked those things out. We don't include them in our conversation with God. I have a recommendation for you today. God will be as real to you as the conversations you have with him. God will be as real to you 
as the conversations you have with him. Pour out your soul. Another thing, confession is good for the soul. I'll have the worship team come up. Confession is good for the soul. In James 5, it says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Pretending is a soul-destroying exercising. Exercise. Anytime we're pretending, something is happening to our soul and it's not good. To speak and act, to make something look other than it is, to engage in fantasy, this is not healthy for our soul. Pretending is not a form of hope. Pretending is a form of deception. And our soul doesn't do well in deception. I can pretend with other people or I could be vulnerable with other people. One of those things is good for the soul. I can pretend to myself or I can take off the blinders of blame that I throw under people under the bus and actually deal with the, the real issues of my life. Only one of those options is good for the soul. I can pretend to God or I can pour out my soul to him. It is better, it is better to be an honest mess before God than a pretend perfect person. He's our savior. He sent Jesus, his son, his one and only son. So when people came and they were open and they were vulnerable and they poured their souls out to him and they acknowledged things that were hard to say but were incredibly true, how did Jesus respond? When Peter falls at his feet, he says, you need to create distance between you and me because I am not good. I'm a sinful person. What does Jesus do with Peter? He says, we need to spend more time together and I've got some important things for you to do. That's what happens when you confess your sins and pour your soul out to God. Or, or how about the, the story that Jesus told about the prodigal son? when he comes back from having wasted everything that was his inheritance, he had nothing left to show for it except a lot of weight loss and no friends and a life that was completely bereft of any hope at all. He comes back home and he falls on the ground. He just starts confessing, I've sinned against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. He just starts that out. And what does the father do? The father wraps him up in his arms and squeezes life back into him and restores him to the family. Or how about the tax collector who stood in the temple and bowed his head and beat his chest and said, I'm not even worthy to be standing here. Be merciful on me, O oh God, because I am a sinner. Jesus said that person went away justified. That's what happens when we confess our sins before God. That's what happens when we have these intimate conversations where we describe our feelings and our fearings to God. Our soul needs God. It's how the song started. As the deer pants for water, so my soul pants for you. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with him? Well, as it turns out, he is here to break every single chain that binds you. He is here to bear any burden that buries you. He is here to heal any hopeless heart and to bless the broken. How many are glad God is here? He is here. So let's bow our heads this morning. Father, in this world, our souls get thin and shallow and fragile and drained and dry. Our world is not an optimal environment for our soul, but you have provided resources for us to be able to strengthen the health of, and, the, and the prosperity of our soul. Would you help us access those today? By your grace and in your name, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.